morning, everyone. Two weeks ago, we opened vaccinations to those 70 and older, and yesterday, the 65 plus population. As of close of business yesterday, 18,600 had signed up. As we've said, after completing this age ban, we'll next start vaccinating people with certain high risk conditions because they're at higher risk if they contract COVID. Our strategy from the start has been to protect those at most at risk and to preserve life. We know age is the number one risk factor and we're already seeing the positive impacts of our strategy amongst our elderly population. With Johnson & Johnson receiving approval over the weekend on top of increased supply from Moderna and Pfizer, we'll be able to scale up and move quicker to get more people vaccinated. Which brings me to today's announcements. First, this coming Monday, March 8th, we'll open phase five to Vermonters with certain high-risk conditions. Because this is a larger population than most of, it, of the age bands, uh, we're going to split it into two, two components. So starting Monday, phase 5A will open to those with certain high-risk conditions over the age of 55. One le week later, March 15th, those uh, 16 and older with these same conditions will be eligible. Dr. Levine will go over the, which conditions are included and Secretary Smith will go into much more detail, but we're doing it in two phases because even amongst high risk conditions, age is still a big factor. So I wanna emphasize, and we should recognize what a major milestone this is. And by March 15th, all those over the age of 16 who are at the highest risk of severe illness and death, whether due to age or a health condition, will be able to sign up for their vaccine. It was March 13th of last year when I declared the state of emergency. And now, almost one year later, all the most vulnerable would, will be eligible for these incredibly effective vaccines. While I know we still have a way to go, we should think about how remarkable this achievement really is and appreciate the innovation that got us here as we look forward to getting back to normal. Next, because of increased supply through Johnson & Johnson and the federal pharmacy program with Walgreens, we're also able to expand vaccinations for two other systems as well. As we discussed on Friday, our kids are not doing well. And there have been serious public health impacts due to the limitations of hybrid and remote learning. We know getting our kids back in school for in-person instruction five days a week is essential. So with these new developments in our vaccine supply, beginning next week, we'll begin vaccination of school staff as well as childcare and early education providers. This includes giving them the option of the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the two dose vaccines through our partnership with Walgreens. There will also be an expansion of phase 1A, which will expand eligibility in our public safety system. It's important to know that the J&J &J vaccine is proven to be very effective. And with a single shot, it offers logistical benefits as well. And I believe this will prove to be a valuable tool for many. Again, Secretary Smith will go into further detail, but these changes are focused on getting and keeping the public safety and education systems fully operational with an emphasis on the well-being of our kids. These are important steps forward and with more supply, Vermonters can be optimistic that we're on pace to be in a very good place by late spring or early summer. I'll be stepping away now to join our weekly meeting with the White House, but I'll be back following Secretary Smith, Dr. Levine, in our modeling presentation from Commissioner Pichek to provide any updates from that call. And with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Smith to go over um, further details. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. 
As you've heard me say before, our strategy is directed by the data and science and grounded in a commitment to first protect the most vulnerable and preserve life, which will allow us to get back to a some sense of normal a lot faster. That's what we've focused on with today's announcement, and here's what we're going to talk about. First, I will provide you with an update of how many people, 65 and older, have made appointments. I'll also remind folks of various ways you can make an appointment. Next, I'll provide an overall update on our vaccination program and its progress. Then I'll provide an update on our ongoing efforts to build capacity to vaccinate even more Vermonters, including the, uh, the new participation by the Vermont National Guard in our vaccination program. And lastly, I will outline new vaccination efforts that will occur on or around March 8th, uh, which starts next week. So let's get started. As many of you saw in the news this weekend, Johnson & Johnson's one-dose vaccine was approved for use by the FDA. In addition to being a single dose, it does not have special storage requirements, so it will be a great option for us to reach more Vermonters. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Yesterday, we opened registration for those 65 years old and older, and as the governor had mentioned, we had more than 18,000 people register in the first day. As of 9 a.m. this morning, over 20,000, 20,200 people have made appointments. And as a reminder, the total population of this newly eligible 65 to 69 year old group is approximately 42,000. We expect that we will complete this age group relatively quickly to create an account, if you already haven't done so, go on and create an account and make an appointment. Go to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Overall, we've achieved an important milestone over the weekend. Today, 106,300 people have been vaccinated against uh, COVID-19. Think about it. It's over 100,000 Vermonters have been vaccinated. 47,900 have received their first dose of vaccine. 48,400 have received their first and last doses. And we've finalized the call center structure to enable homebound individuals for those that we haven't reached yet to request vaccine appointments starting this Friday, March 5th. If you are homebound and have not been contacted, please call the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878 on Friday. Next, I want to discuss our continuing efforts to expand vaccine capacity. We expect significant increases in vaccine throughout the month of March. We anticipate receiving over 20,000 first doses this week with deliveries expected throughout this week. Right now, we have the capacity to deliver those doses each week. By March 15th, we will increase our capacity to administer 25,000 first doses of vaccine per week. And by month's end, we will increase our capacity to administer 35,000 first doses of vaccine per week. We will continue to adjust capacity in proportion to our vaccine allocation from the federal government. Starting tomorrow, will use the Vermont National Guard to help us get Vermonters vaccinate, vaccinated as quickly as possible. They will administer vaccines in South Burlington at the Doubletree Hotel, and starting next week, their efforts will expand to Barrie and Springfield. We'll register Vermonters for appointments at these new sites through the same website and call center we use for the state-supported vac vaccination sites. We also plan to activate an even larger contingent of the National Guard on March 15th to provide more vaccination opportunities as the supply increases later this month. In addition, Walmart will start vaccinations this week at its six stores in Vermont. This is important, so I want to highlight this. 
you must register for these appointments through the state website, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. You should not call the stores directly. I also want to note that Kinney Drugs, who is partnering with the state's vaccination program, will conduct a large vaccination event for eligible Vermonters at Spalding High School on Sunday, March 7th. That's at Spalding High School on, on Sunday, March 7th. Approximately 1,100 first doses of vaccine are anticipated to be available at the event. Finally, Walgreens will continue to offer vaccinations through the federal program, the federal program they participate in. You, could, you can choose to make an appointment with Walgreens or Kinney Drugs directly if that is more convenient for you. I want Vermonters to know this. We have plenty of slots available to vaccinate eligible Vermonters and more coming online as our supplies increase. You can make appointments at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. You should not make multiple appointments. There's no need to do this since we have a good system in place that will get you vaccinated fairly quickly. Making multiple appointments just prevents someone else from reserving a spot. As the governor mentioned, we're going to be announcing three new vaccination efforts. Next, I'll turn my attention to those additional a vaccination efforts we are mobilizing beginning the week of March 8th. First, we will open registration for phase five. Vermonters age 16 to 64 with high risk conditions. As you'll remember, we've had this phase planned from the outset as part of our age, band, uh, age grouping strategy. Phase five is a large group of approximately 75,000 Vermonters. In order to manage this group and get them vac vaccinated as quickly and as efficiently as possible, phase five will be divided into two segments. Phase 5A, those 55 years old and above with high risk conditions, and phase 5B, those 16 to 54 with high risk conditions. For phase 5A, registration will begin on Monday, March 8th at 8.15 a.m. For phase B, registration will begin Monday, March 15th at 8.15 a.m. A list of eligible high-risk conditions is available at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, and Dr. Levine will review them in just a few moments. Our goal is to make the registration process as, as easy and inclusive as possible, but this is a complex undertaking. First, people with high-risk conditions can check the list of conditions on the Health Department web website to see if they are eligible. Family members, caregivers, and case managers can also check <clears throat> for the list for others in their care. You will make an appointment in our system in the same way Vermonters have done by age grouping. You do not need to contact your health care provider to get documentation of the condition. When the group becomes eligible and you are ready to make an appointment, you will be asked some questions. First, you will, you will say that you have one of the health conditions that makes you eligible for a vaccine. This will serve as self-certification. We trust you to work with us and help make sure that these Vermonters at highest risk due to their medical condition are protected. When making your appointment, you will also be asked to provide information for a health care provider that you see for your condition, if, if you have one. But if you don't have a health care provider, you will still get the vaccine. The health department may use the information you provided to confirm your eligibility, either through medical records or by, or by contacting your provider. You may also reach out, we may also reach out to people who don't have a provider to offer a connection to care. The next thing I want to announce, to support getting our kids back into school five days a week, we will deploy vaccines for child care providers and teachers and school staff starting next week. 
as you heard the governor and uh, mental health commissioner Sarah Squirrel and Secretary French say last week, our kids are not okay. This is not anybody's fault. It is, however, the unfortunate fact that part-time in-person instruction and remote learning is not meeting their needs. To that end, we will leverage our new supply of vaccines and the expanded federal pharmacy program to support accomplishing the goal that we know educators and Vermonters share. Specifically, beginning next week, we will begin to offer teachers and school staff and child care providers the option of receiving single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine at clinics in their district. EMS, Department of Health staff, Vermont National Guard, and school nurses will be on site at vaccination clinics, school districts, or in smaller schools to assist with this effort. Because this vaccine needs less special handling than others, Johnson & Johnson is the ideal candidate for this type of on-site vaccination approach. On Friday, we will have details on how to schedule a vaccine for both teachers and school staff and child care providers who wish to make an appointment at the, schools, at the school designated vaccine, vaccine sites. In addition, Appointments at Walgreens in the coming weeks will be available, available for these eligible employees for the two-dose Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. A list of eligible employees will be given to Walgreens to ensure that the system is not abused. Specific instructions on timing and how to enroll with Walgreens will be provided directly to teachers and school staff and child care providers as appointments become available. This special program for educators and child care providers is distinct in design and separate from our primary vaccination program, which is age grouping. It will look different and operate differently. As I'll explain in a moment, our age grouping approach will continue throughout the end of the pandemic, and it will be expanded as our allotments from the federal government increase. Because of how we are vaccinating, more at a localized level is anticipated that this will take us into the first weeks of April to complete vaccination of teachers and school staff and child care providers. I ask that these individuals be patient because it is a newly developed program. We will go forward deliberately and cautiously and then ramp it up fairly quickly. And of course, all of this is dependent upon ongoing supply from the federal government. Lastly, on or about March 8th, we will expand the definition of first responders to include police staff such as sergeants, lieutenants, and others, 911 call takers who are needed to direct emergency personnel to emergencies, and staff who work in correctional facilities that house detainees or incarcerated individuals. For those folks, Working in state correctional facilities, we will offer the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine on site or the option of the double-dose Pfizer or Moderna vaccine through Walgreens. As with teachers and school staff and child care providers, a list of eligible staff members will be given to Walgreens. More information will be available about first responders next week. Just wrapping up, Looking ahead, all of this means will ensure more Vermonters are eligible more quickly and vaccinated at a faster pace. We expect that we'll be able to move to appointments for those age 60 and older later this month with older Vermonters, with other Vermonters eligible in the weeks thereafter. While we can't offer you a prediction now regarding when all Vermonters over 16 will be eligible, as the supplies increase, we will see eligibility expand in the months ahead. Of course, as more doses become available, we will vaccinate Vermonters as quickly as possible. And we believe our approach will pr prove to be one of the fastest and most effective in the country. You know, there is now clear light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. I can't tell you how proud I am of all of you. 
how you hung in there during the dark days, and how you are abiding by the safeguards we need to continue as we move forward towards ending this pandemic. I want to thank you for everything that you've done. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Good morning. We're reporting 70 cases today and unfortunately one additional death. There are 23 people in the hospital with COVID-19, including seven in the ICU. These numbers are quite low in comparison to where we've been over the last several weeks. Our positivity rate over a seven-day period remains quite low as well at 1.5%. Last uh, week, I shared some information about testing at Bromley and Stratton ski areas. We now have some data from one more weekend of testing. As I noted before, this is a limited snapshot as testing was offered to anyone who wanted it, whether they were employees, skiers, or even local residents. Of 264 people tested at both areas, from Vermont and from out of state, there were a total of eight positives four of which are being confirmed through PCR testing still. The first weekend we reported earlier, we tested 227 people with just a few positives. Despite its limited nature, my takeaway from this data is not so much what we found, but what we didn't find. This testing did not show high rates of COVID-19 being brought into the state. We were again glad to see people interested in getting tested, helping us get a glimpse into what may be happening at these seasonal areas. We again thank Bromley and Stratton Mountain Urgent Care for working with us in these efforts. The ski area testing is now complete, but we still have regular testing available in Stratton and on the weekend in Manchester, and have been glad to see the increased numbers in Bennington County leveling off. There are really now only three hospitalized patients at Southwest Vermont Medical Center. Despite our cases easing their way down, we continue to monitor situations on our college campuses as well, where we did expect to see more cases in the spring semester initially. At some campuses, such as Norwich University, we're definitely starting to see improvement with no new cases in almost a week. At UVM, where cases have occurred regularly since the start of this semester, recent testing has shown a decrease in new case rates. Our teams are working to provide guidance to their health officials and students, especially those who require quarantine or are involved in sports. We support their efforts to test more aggressively to catch the virus before it can spread further with a twice-weekly student testing schedule. The administration has increased the severity of sanctions developed outdoor settings where students can escape the isolation of their rooms, created ample quarantine housing, and a positive result is that most of their athletic teams are able to engage in competitions. Commissioner Pichak will show you some of the data indicating a decline in cases overall in the state at our campuses. As you know, we continue to monitor spread in Franklin County, which is beginning to show signs of leveling off. And we have added tests in northern Franklin County the first two weeks of March, thanks to Missisquoi Valley Rescue. Tests are free and there is no registration. You can find all the information on our website, healthvermont.gov testing, in addition to testing available throughout the state. Testing still remains a critical tool to slowing the spread of COVID-19 and I strongly recommend Vermonters take advantage of it if they feel they have a need to get tested for any reason. Especially with the threat of more transmissible variants of the virus, I will emphasize once again that the month of March will be a key time in our race to keep those variants at bay while we vaccinate as many people as we can. Even though we are all more than ready for this pandemic to end, 
We cannot afford to lose the gains we've made against the virus. We can all do our part by getting tested and of course keeping up with all the usual prevention protocols, including wearing a mask, keeping our distance, and avoiding crowds. Now I'd like to add a little more detail to Secretary Smith's preview of Vermonters with high-risk health conditions who will soon be eligible for vaccination. We announced the conditions here before, but have since refined the list to provide more clarity on what qualifies as a, cert, as a qualifying condition. You can find on our website at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 vaccine this list, but I'll now share it with you here. Current cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, which includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis, heart disease, which includes heart attack, heart failure, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, which is angina, acute and chronic ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathies, and pulmonary hypertension. Note this list does not include high blood pressure. Immunocompromised states, meaning a weakened immune system due to solid organ transplant, blood or bone marrow transplant, immune deficiencies, or other causes. Or HIV with a low CD4 cell count or not on HIV treatment. Or prolonged use of corticosteroids or other immune suppressing drugs. Severe obesity, which means a body mass index of 40 or larger. Pregnancy, sickle cell disease, type 2 diabetes. The newest additions are type 1 diabetes and disabilities including chromosomal disorders such as Down syndrome, intellectual disabilities meaning a lower IQ, disabilities that compromise lung function such as neurologic and muscular conditions like muscular dystrophy, spina bifida, and multiple sclerosis for some examples. Now, as you heard, you do not need to connect with your health care provider to get documentation of these conditions to receive the vaccine. We're glad to be that much closer to protecting these Vermonters who, as the data shows, are at higher risk for severe illness and death from COVID-19. Finally, of course, the biggest news on the vaccination front is the FDA's authorization of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for emergency use and the recommendation by the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices with doses already going out for delivery as we speak. This third vaccine will be a game changer so that more of us can get vaccinated more quickly, our pathway out of this pandemic. This vaccine is different from the mRNA vaccines we've been using. It uses an adenovirus vector that cannot replicate in the human body, and it uses this vector to deliver instructions to make the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, to which our body then mounts its defenses and makes antibodies. The phase three study that allowed this vaccine to achieve emergency use authorization enrolled 44,000 participants, was conducted on three continents and during a time of high COVID-19 incidents, while viral variants were emerging, unlike the previous vaccine trials. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is rated as highly effective at preventing serious illness, as are the two vaccines we already have. Data for this vaccine showed a 72% efficacy rate in the U.S. study population against moderate illness and was especially protective against severe COVID-19 with an 85% efficacy rate and was 100% effective against hospitalization and death. This was irrespective of variants, especially the South African one. This is the protection that matters most. There was similar performance regardless of age, sex, race, or comorbidities. It's a single shot 
that can be kept in normal refrigeration, which makes it easier to distribute and administer, and it has noticeably milder side effects, according to the FDA report. It honestly amazes me to think back a year ago when there were so many unknowns about this new coronavirus. Just one year later, we are able to use long research technologies to develop three effective vaccines. We are now in a good position to move quickly to protect our communities and get back to life once more. Now, we cannot directly compare the performance of this vaccine with the mRNA vaccines due to different study protocols, different timing during the pandemic. Nonetheless, the bottom line summary is that this vaccine will be a valuable addition to our vaccine supply, and it is as effective as its predecessors in preventing severe illness and death. It is easily storable and safe and convenient with its single dosage labeling. And it is available now when we hope an even greater supply by the end of this month. And the goal is for Vermonters to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. And I encourage you to take whichever vaccine is available to you and not get caught up in a numbers comparison game. These are all effective and safe vaccines. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for his model. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Levine, and good morning, everyone. Uh, while the decline of cases regionally and nationally has come to a halt this week, Vermont continued its slow and steady improvement in all of the key metrics, with fewer cases this week among our most vulnerable and overall, fewer individuals in the hospital, uh, and fewer deaths in February than the previous two months. There are still many reasons for optimism when we look at our own data, but as we've heard today, we must remain vigilant over the next few months as we bridge into warmer weather and further vaccination progress. After six straight weeks of falling case counts, the national seven-day average stalled this week with cases being relatively flat. And while we'll need probably another week's worth of data to know exactly uh, if this is a temporary slowdown uh, or if in fact cases have stalled, uh, we do see that the numbers have started to bend back down over the last couple of days. And all of the major national models that are out there continue to forecast cases decreasing in the weeks ahead. The other national trend lines are moving in the right direction with the decrease in hospitalizations continuing for a seventh straight week, now down 60% since January. And thankfully, the U.S. death rate is continuing its declining trend with the seven-day average falling 19% over the past two weeks. The Northeast also saw its cases stall and increase over the past week, with the region reporting just under 83,000 new cases, an 8% increase week over week. Vermont and New Hampshire were the only two jurisdictions in the region that saw their weekly case numbers improve. But again, like the rest of the country, the region continued to see improvements in its positivity rate, its hospitalization rate, and its fatality rate, all good signs. And also like the national models, the regional forecast still anticipates declining cases over the next few weeks. But we will need to continue to watch these numbers closely uh, and watch the regional data closely over the next week to again see if the cases are moving in the right direction. Now turning to Vermont's data, we can see that there was broad improvement in our metrics throughout the month of February. Our cases decreased by about 20%, but our most important metrics, hospitalizations and deaths, decreased considerably over this period of time. And just as important, the percentage of Vermonters who are now fully vaccinated have tripled. Our seven-day case average continues to trend in the right direction with Vermont reporting 694 cases this week, a 35 case decrease from the previous week. And most importantly, we continue to see cases among our most vulnerable continue to decrease. We continue to see this population, who is now our most vaccinated population, continue to fall more quickly than the broader population, with this age group falling 77 percent 
in terms of new cases over the last six weeks. Further, the number of active outbreaks in long-term care facilities has decreased down to just two. And with fewer uh, cases among our most vulnerable, we are starting to see fewer deaths month over month as well. And even the fatalities that we're seeing more recently, it's important to remember that uh, many of them were infected weeks ago when the case counts were much higher and the vaccination percentages were much lower. So we do anticipate that deaths will continue to fall uh, into the month of March since we have many fewer vulnerable Vermonters contracting the virus. Looking across Vermont, only two counties uh, stand out from the crowd, as Dr. Levine mentioned. Bennington and Franklin counties continue to have higher active case counts than the rest of the states, but both are showing improvement as of recent. Regarding higher education, this was in fact the best week of the spring semester, with only 39 cases being reported, and this is out of nearly 21,000 tests that were conducted this past week which is the greatest number of tests administered on campus since the higher education restart began last fall. This brings the semester case total to 456 cases in Vermont. Regarding hospitalizations, we continue to see our numbers drop in the seven-day average, falling rapidly for general hospital beds. The ICU numbers are coming down a little more slowly, as this is a, tends to be a lagging indicator but we do anticipate fewer admissions into the hospital in the weeks ahead as we are seeing fewer cases, again, amongst our most vulnerable. Turning to the Vermont forecast, with the continued gradual decline in cases that we continue to see in Vermont, our forecast is more optimistic, with cases expected to fall throughout March and into April. But, of course, we must keep a few things in mind. These forecasted improvements are certainly not guaranteed, and with the high active case count in Vermont and new variants circulating throughout our region, these trends can quickly reverse. Ultimately, it's our own behavior over the next six weeks that will determine the outcome. So please do remain vigilant and continue to follow the public health guidelines uh, as we get closer to the finish line. Looking at Vermont's vaccination progress, we can see the total number of Vermonters who have received at least one dose of the vaccine continues to climb. But as importantly, as Secretary Smith mentioned, the number of vaccines administered on a daily basis continues to increase as well, now steadily surpassing more than 2,000 doses administered a day on a seven-day average for the first time since the vaccination program began. And this places Vermont second in the Northeast and 11th nationally in terms of doses administered. So that's first and second doses combined. And when you look at um, where we rank for the population that is fully vaccinated, Vermont continues to rank ninth nationally with a little more than 9% of Vermonters now fully vaccinated. And with that, I think we'll open it up to questions and I'll uh, turn the moderator over to Mike Smith. Okay, hey, Rebecca, we're ready. All right, we'll start with Calvin. Uh, thanks, Secretary Smith. So I'm, I'm just wondering um, how many doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are we going to get? And by opening up the age, or opening up vaccines to um, childcare and teachers, uh, I'm wondering how that isn't going to set back the vaccination process for uh, Vermonters with the underlying conditions. Well, we have estimated, and obviously we've used all the calculations that we have. We haven't diverted any of the main um, vaccine supply for those, what I would call our traditional age banding groups, including high risk in that. What we've used is new, new availability of vaccine. We have 5,400 doses that just came in of Johnson & Johnson. Um, we hope that supply continues as it moves down. Obviously, that's an easier dose to administer. Uh, we hope to have the teachers done, uh, teachers and child care providers and staff, school staff done um, by the first week of April using that method and also using the, ph the federal pharmacy method, method that isn't in our regular allocation that we have. So we really haven't touched 
the allocation that is dedicated to all the age banding and instead used extra supply that we're receiving in order to do this other, um, other segment. I, uh, I imagine there might be some um, frontline workers in, in grocery stores or other parts of the uh, economy that might be kind of frustrated with this news. I guess what, what would your message uh, be to, to them? Well, the, our goal in the beginning was to protect life. And we're still doing that in terms of how we've done the age banding. And we'll start turning back to 60 and above uh, towards the end of the, the month as well, before the end of the month as well. We'll get to those age, band, um, age bands as we move down. And we'll get to them fairly quickly. But at the same time, I think you heard last week, our kids are not doing well. I mean, that's our future. And our kids are not doing well. So we have to address that. Uh, and get, um, get our schools back into five days a week. I think everybody in this state wants that. They want, the kids, the kids want it. They want to get back to school in five days a week. The teachers want it. The parents want it. And I think that's what the important part. And we have, uh, we have done this one program without abandoning our age banding as we've uh, moved forward. So I would say to those, uh, we're looking out for the welfare of those kids as we uh, as we move through both the age banding and this sort of special program, and then just one last clarifying question: um, home child care providers <clears throat> are there um, husbands or spouses or wives, uh, family members? Will they be eligible as well? No, uh, only the child care provider will be eligible. Even if they host the clinic or the, uh, yeah, the operation. That, that's right. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Second phone, sorry. Take your time. One of the questions we have with the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine as it came out, um, how is that going to be dispersed? Is that uh, being sent to, because of the uh, storage capacity for the thing, uh, is that going to be uh, sent to the more rural locations or places where they don't have the, uh, the capacity to hold the other vaccines? Um, and are you worried that people won't come back for the second dose on the, pri the, the first two? I'll, let me start off with that, and then I'll, a I'll ask Dr. Levine to, to tackle the worried about the second dose aspect of it. Um, our first allocations in the month of March for um, uh, the Johnson & Johnson will be as I mentioned to Calvin, will be dedicated to the, um, the, the teachers, um, the school employees, and child care providers. That will be dedicated going to that. After that, we'll look at the, the, the way that we administer it uh, going forward. But right now, for the short term, that's where our dosages are going for Johnson & Johnson. In terms of the second dose, Dr. Levine, could you um, address that? I'll just expand on what the Secretary just said first. Um, there are all kinds of suggestions being made about Johnson & Johnson, uh, not necessarily policy from government officials, but suggestions because of its uh, ease of administration. Some of that involves, as you said, Steve, rural areas. Um, but I mean, we're a pretty rural state, so it's kind of hard to say that one part of the state would benefit more than another from getting that vaccine for its population. Others have said that there are populations that are less likely to be compliant with a second dose. Um, populations that have been raised in that vein are the homeless population. Um, and I apologize to college students, but they have been uh, named in that as well. Uh, so, you know, my sense is most states are going to take the vaccine and integrate it into its general uh, vaccination program so that we can get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And I, I truly think that um, having it done in an integrated way can be fine. Uh, it doesn't have to select a place or a population necessarily. With regard to the second dose from the Pfizer and the Moderna, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, anybody is going to be 100% compliant with anything we do in healthcare. So there's always going to be people that drop off and don't show back up for their second dose. 
But I think most people understand, and the data is beginning to help us reveal, that you really do gain a much bigger boost in your immune response if you get that second dose. And why have invested all your time and energy in getting the first dose if you're not going to follow through and really optimally protect yourself from the virus? Obviously, people who may have had a severe reaction to the first dose, that's a different story, but they are an infinitesimally small number of people in our state right now. And since you're right there, <laughs> um, with the other two, the second dose is a, is a plus two weeks uh, time frame for determining that you're fully protected. Uh, are you looking at four weeks after the single dose or two weeks or how's that yeah, work? So, so the data from the study trials uh, did actually look at two weeks and at four weeks. Um, and the kind of data that I cited before with the uh, really uh, remarkable efficacy was really at the four week point. It was on the way at the two-week point, but uh, it was much better at the four-week point. So I would suggest people consider themselves most optimally protected at the four-week point and not make assumptions at the two-week point. Thank you. Stuart, NBC5. Good morning. Um, I'm already hearing from grocery store workers or family members with grocery store workers and their family who think they deserve the same consideration um, as school teachers and child care workers um, for this vaccination. What is your take, Dr. Levine, on, on the relative risks uh, for that group? Well, if you mean are they at extraordinarily high risk of a bad outcome from COVID, generally we have not seen that or found that. Um, they, can, they still do work in an environment where there can be physical distancing. There is supposed to be, and there generally has been good adherence to masking. And the facilities are generally large enough so that being in a crowded part is not much of an issue. Uh, so I, I do empathize. Uh, I, I, I was once a grocery store worker long, long ago. And the reality is the public is there at all times. Uh, I understand that, uh, but that doesn't mean that your risk is heightened at all times. And we're just not seeing that, you know, certainly not in our statistics uh, with regards to who's had the worst outcomes uh, in Vermont from uh, COVID-19. So I do, I do have empathy, but at the same time, I do think that the age banding approach will get them vaccinated far more quickly than they might imagine. Because as we've already talked, we're talking the early part of April at the latest to finish all of the things you've heard about today. And then we're going to anticipate more Johnson & Johnson coming in. And we hope when the governor returns, he'll have some good news on that regard. Continuing increased allocations on the Pfizer and the Moderna so that the next sets of age bands will go much, much more briskly just as these most recent ones are going. Okay, uh, if I could hold off on my second question for when the governor's back. All right. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Ed? Yeah, uh, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my question is going to go to uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, the question I brought up back in December, uh, right now, the, many members of the homeless population are being sheltered. Uh, we know who they are. We know where they are. Uh, when we get into the warmer months, they might start to disperse. Uh, would you have that consideration, including homeless uh, people, uh, to get the uh, Johnson Johnson vaccine as it's becoming more available? Yeah, Ed, this is Mike Smith. I'll take that question. We are looking uh, at this, um, you know, where do we deploy the Johnson & Johnson after um, the, the teachers, the school staff, and um, child care? And that is, I think Dr. Levine brought that up just a little while ago. That is one of the populations that would uh, be a prime sort of candidate for where we deploy it uh, 
later. We will be. We should be through the uh, those um, all of the things that I discussed today, as Dr. Levine said, by um, by the beginning of April. So you know, as we sort of look at the next population, especially for Johnson and Johnson, who will it be? I think you'll see Ed, that that will be one of the candidates for that particular vaccine. Okay, thank you. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Governor Scott. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Uh, I just got off the phone with fellow governors in the White House for our weekly meeting, and we heard um, some encouraging news uh, as well as uh, some realistic news. Uh, first, we heard that Pfizer and Moderna allocations will e increase next week to 15.2 million, up from 14.5 million to the states. That will be a 700,000 uh, uh, increase, which will mean uh, 700 uh, for Vermont, an increase of 700 for Vermont. Uh, that means for just these two vaccines, Vermont will receive at least 15,000 for the next three weeks. That's the minimum, 15,000. Uh, the federal pharmacy program will also see a slight increase, uh, 300,000 from 2.1 million to 2.4 million, which will be 300, an increase of 300 doses for Vermont. By the end of March, they expect to deliver 17.8 or 17 to 18 million weekly, and that's not including Johnson and Johnson. So uh, that's up from the 15 million that we're receiving next week. Um, in terms of Johnson and Johnson, uh, Vermont. Uh, already has its uh, first round of J&J &J in hand. Uh, we believe that it's a little bit different from what they are saying, so we're trying to clarify that. Uh, by uh, the calculations given, they said that they were going to be delivering um, about 2.9 million, I believe, and I have that somewhere else, but um, which will would equate to about uh, 3,000 doses uh, for Vermont, but we believe we have in hand, and we'll clarify this, we believe we have uh, about 5,000 in hand right now. So there's something wrong with the numbers there. Um, again, uh, the, uh, the realistic sobering news is there won't be, they said there will not be a distribution of Johnson & Johnson next week. And they're not guaranteeing anything in the third week, although there may be a smaller amount. Uh, but they said by the end of March, we should be getting four to 6,000 doses every single week. And then in April, they believe we'll be getting, uh, receiving five to 6,000 weekly. So again, uh, the first in March, um, it's going to be limited, uh, but we already have some in hand. So we'll be able to start with what we uh, spoke about earlier. Uh, next week, uh, but the following week uh, could be challenging, so we'll have to uh, see what that does with us. We also heard that Johnson & Johnson and Merck, a major pharma company, are teaming up for production of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which would be helpful, and I think that's where we're going to see uh, vastly increased supplies in the near future. So with that, we'll get back to questions. Yeah, well, good morning. Uh, thanks, Governor. I, on an unrelated, on a town meeting question, if I could, uh, a couple of dozen towns are voting on hosting cannabis businesses, including, I think, your hometown of uh, Berlin. How do you come down on that question? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, how I voted or? Well, if you're willing to yeah. share, yes. Yeah, I'm, I am We'll see what happens with the number of communities uh, that, uh, that are voting today. I'd be happy to tell you how I voted on that next week, or at least after today, but uh, I certainly don't want to skew anything's or anybody's opinion one way or the other on my, on my vote on that particular issue. So uh, I'll get back to you on that, but, 
but again, it should be interesting. I don't know how to gauge uh, the reaction throughout Vermont, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. All right, thank you. All right, we'll go to Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. Um, we heard from a local woman who made two appointments for a vaccine through the Department of Health website and then made another through the link to Walgreens. She's not receiving confirmations and she's been monitoring her spam folder. Is this sort of thing happening with any frequency? I'm just, uh, maybe I can understand the, the question and then turn it over to Secretary Smith or so we all understand the question. Has she made three appointments for herself or is it? Yes. And she's not getting the confirmation. Secretary Smith. Yeah, Lisa, this is the first that I've heard of it in terms of not getting confirmation from uh, the uh, website from the Department of Health. Um, I know that you do get a, you do get a confirmation. It says AHS confirmation uh, on it. Um, if you look at that, it won't. It, it, it comes in as AHS confirmation, Agency of Human Service confirmation. But um, let me reach out to you after this. If if the list, if your reader has, um, if you have the permission of your reader, we'd like to sort of intervene and help out. The other thing is call the uh, vaccine call center at 855-722-7878, and they can probably help her, but we have not heard that. In fact, you know, from, uh, from experience, I, I have seen the actual confirmation and how that works, and we have not seen that as an issue yet. Thank you. I will pass that information on to her, but don't go away. I have another quick question for you as well. Sure. Will school district staff who, who are not front-facing receive vaccines as well, so people who work in the central office, for example? Depends on where they are. If their central office is not in the school, then the answer is no. If their central office is in the school, then the answer is yes. There are some school districts that have their central office outside of the school. Okay, thank you. And may I ask a question of Secretary Curley? Sure. Of course. Okay. Um, would businesses with no employees be eligible for funds from the legislature's newest um, COVID relief package? I'm thinking of a local theater group that has a mortgage and has a building but has no employees. Just, just, a a, just as a reminder, Lisa and uh, Secretary Curley, I think that's just passed the House. It has not been considered by the Senate at this point, they haven't even taken it up. So there could be some changes along the way. Okay. Yeah, and I apologize. I don't, I don't know the answer to your specific question because things are changing um, daily. So I don't know how it landed when it just passed the house. I'll check back next week. Thank you all very but much. They're off this week, Thank Lisa, you. as well. So there won't be any action oh, right. taken on that until next week. So that'll be the first we hear back from them. Okay, thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, seven days. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, I'm wondering what you can tell us about aid to Vermont small businesses that is going to come out of the federal stimulus package. Again, that hasn't completely passed at this point in time, still being considered by the Senate, correct? The federal yep. stimulus package is the one you're talking about right, right. now? Yep, I, it is that one. I know it's still in the house. It hasn't gone before the Senate yet, but I'm just wondering what you do know. I, I just, yeah, well, I don't know if Lindsay knows anything about this or Julie or oh, Suzanne, but um, I would just be, be cautious. I'd just be cautious. Yeah, I'd be cautious about that uh, at this point in time because we don't know what's going to come out in the very end. Uh, the question was, uh, Secretary Curley or uh, Secretary Young, uh, about business uh, opportunities within the economic relief or the stimulus bill that's coming out of the uh, Congress or could potentially coming out of the Congress uh, that hasn't been passed by the, uh, the Senate at this point. Just for small business. 
about opportunity. I'm sorry, I still don't understand. You're asking about what opportunities are in the for, in the bill for small business for right now, as it stands for small business. Yeah. Um, again, there's a variety of different carve outs for different sectors. What I don't know is how it would relate to a certain size of a business. Um, again, it's too soon to tell on this. Um, so I, I, I can look into that and see if I can give you a better answer on that. Um, the other thing, um, you know, again, there's a specific set aside for restaurants and shuttered venues. But again, I don't know what the criteria is in terms of how big or how small they are. I'm not sure if I got that right. If I if I could go back to um, Lisa Loomis, uh, her question, I just want to I just want to answer the version that the House passed that she was talking about of the bill um, for helping those businesses in Vermont that haven't been helped yet. Uh, to answer her question, the answer is yes. Um, they do not need employees to qualify. So if the bill were to pass the Senate in the same form, um, then then the example that you put forth is, is uh, potentially that that business would be eligible to qualify I, even though they have no employees. I, I just want to clarify one thing again. I think, I believe, we're talking about two separate bills. There's a COVID relief oh, yeah. bill are, in the yeah. in the state legislature, in Vermont legislature right now, that has not passed. It's passed the House and is now going before the Senate. The same holds true, though, uh, for the the Congress. Uh, it's passed the House. It's now going before the Senate, and it still uh, has a ways to go. And I don't know what's going to be included in the final version of either. So it's the same. Um, there are two separate bills, though. Yeah, I was asking about the federal one. Okay. So Thank the, you. the question before um, with Lisa Loomis is, was a different question. All righty. All set, Ann? Yep, I'm all set. Thank you. Greg, the county yeah. courier. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I want to just quickly circle back to Stuart's question uh, about cannabis being on the ballot today. Governor, you let everybody know publicly as soon as you voted for president who you voted for when you left the polls. But now you don't want to release how you voted uh, today. Why the change? Yeah, it was if you remember, uh, Greg, and I'm sure you're on top of this, but that was like at uh, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, almost to the end when the polls were going to close. And uh, so it's a different situation now. We're, we're midday. A lot of people haven't even voted yet. So um, I just, again, uh, you know, I have, uh, I don't mind sharing uh, the information, uh, but I don't want to do it soon uh, before uh, people have, uh, the majority of people have a, a chance to vote. Uh, and again, uh, just not to influence one way or the other. Uh, so. Uh, same holds true here. Would, would you let you know Stuart and I know by you know five or six o'clock, maybe his broadcast time? I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you know next uh, the next press conference. Okay. Um, moving on, Governor, uh, your administration has said for months that the rollout of of the dispersion of uh, vaccines was based on data and a mortality rate, uh, but at the same time, you insisted that. It was very infrequent that COVID spread within the school system. Now, as you move to vac uh, vaccinate teachers and children, uh, it, it seems to some that you're ignoring the mortality rate of the 50 to 64 year old age group. Yeah. Oh, um, well, well, again, let, let's go. Let's go back. First of all, we said uh, um, the death rate as well as hospitalizations. So we have that data. It shows anyone uh, 65 and over, 90% of those uh, have been 65 and over the deaths, uh, as well as hospitalizations uh, in a large category. Um, so then we're moving right now to those with certain health conditions. So once we take care of that, um, we feel as though we're taking care of the most vulnerable in that, that respect. And I've said for quite some time, we've been willing to look at a different approach. And, and as I said, our kids not, are not okay, and we need to do all we can uh, to get them back into in-person instruction. Uh, one of the challenges, one of the large obstacles in the way is to make sure that we're vaccinating uh, those uh, in the education system. 
So we're looking at this as a system uh, because we know it's important for the health of our kids uh, to get them back into school. Now, uh, again, we're, this is for staff within the education system, not for uh, the kids. There's no vaccine at this point approved for anyone. Uh, in one case, I think it's 16 and over, the other is 18 and over. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, the students are not going to be vaccinated uh, in this round. But we think it's that important. And uh, we need to do all we can from our standpoint uh, to, uh, to get through that, that hurdle. And we'll have many hurdles uh, to come in terms of trying to get them back into in-person instruction. But this was a major hurdle, and, uh, and we feel that it was necessary. But we wanted to take care of the most vulnerable first, which we've committed to. I, I've just I've heard concerns from members of the public that, you know, for one thing, for, for one person I talked to yesterday, they're 64 years old. They can't get in with the age banding until they turn 65 in August, which presumably they'd probably be in before that. Um, but they kind of felt like a move to vaccinate those in the school system is kind of an indicator to the strength of the teachers union. Is there actual data? to show that that's not the case? Well, we, we've brought the data to you in the last, uh, at least the last press conference uh, from uh, the, our, our commissioner of uh, mental health as well as pediatricians along the way that say our kids are impacted and it's all related to uh, the pandemic because they're, uh, they're not getting that interaction, the social interaction that they need uh, in order to be healthy. So. Uh, again, we're trying to do what we can to overcome that, and we think this is the best route forward. Now, I'm sensitive uh, to the fact that we need to make sure we go back in some form to age banding. That's my approach, but we're going to be talking about uh, different uh, different approaches as we move forward. Uh, we'll get through uh, those with uh, those uh, health conditions, certain health conditions, we believe uh, by the end of March or somewhere in that range and then we'll move back uh, and do something uh, different uh, and maybe um, be able to go on a parallel path with our age banding approach. But, um, but again, uh, we look at, uh, we took care of, we feel, uh, the vast majority of those who are impacted uh, in terms of death and in terms of hospitalization by doing those 65 and over, as well as those with certain health conditions. Thank you, and one other real quick follow-up. Uh, is this going to include non-school staff, uh, such as basketball and hockey coaches, or is it is it completely constricted to school staff? Anyone within the footprint of the school building, the system. So, so like teachers, like like coaches and and, and yes. staff aren't going to qualify. No. no, they will qualify. Thank you. If they're they, yeah, let okay. me be be clear. Uh, coaches, if they're in the system. Uh, they're part of the staff within the education system. And if they're on the premises in the, in the school itself, uh, then they will, be, they will be vaccinated as well. Okay, thank you, Governor. Thank yeah. you for your time. Peter, VPR. Um, quick clarifying question before I get to my main one. Um, will school staff at independent and private schools uh, be eligible for the vaccine? I believe so, yes. And I'm getting nods of yes. Okay. Um, the uh, education community, I'm, I'm sure, will, will welcome this news, but a lot of principals and superintendents uh, have made it clear that the impediment to a return to full in person has uh, as much to do with the guidance as anything, um, specifically distancing guidelines. Will the agency be? Uh, announcing any revisions to those guidelines to reduce barriers to full in-person instruction? Well, again, this is a, a huge hurdle uh, that we're uh, getting beyond at this point in time. Uh, and this is what we heard loud and clear. And we want to be able to work together in order to accomplish the goal. And I think if we can all now, at this point in time, agree to the goal, uh, we can get uh, through the other hurdles that aren't as big as this one. Uh, and I know that uh, the physical distancing is an issue. In fact, on the call I was just on, uh, and we heard from uh, the CDC and, and others, the experts on the call, 
uh, with the White House, and they talked about uh, the six-foot distancing, for instance. Uh, and they said, um, really important uh, that you get across uh, to those in the educational community uh, that wearing, continuing to wear masks is important. It's essential. Um, and, 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 and the ref reason they put the six-foot distance uh, for those located in high transmission areas, and they were, they were emphatic about that. The, the guidance was for a six-foot distance for those located in high transmission areas. And, uh, and it was to preclude uh, when someone wasn't wearing their mask uh, from becoming infected. So they said, others get creative. We're still, this is guidance only. Uh, but get creative, uh, move furniture around, try to do everything you can to maintain that six-foot distance. If that can't be accomplished, find other ways. And they, and they mentioned, I wrote a couple things down because I think they're going to be under uh, CDC guidance that they're going to be releasing. But they said if you can't accomplish that between students, uh, do all you can to, to do that if it's, if it's achievable. Uh, but if you can't, make sure there's six-foot distance between the students and teachers, that's number one. Number two, they said open windows and doors, get the air circulating. Utilize fans uh, as well to keep the air circulating. So uh, the creativity is something that they, they again talked about and we'll hear uh, more about this from the CDC, I believe, uh, in the coming days. Uh, but. Uh, but again, we look forward, uh, Secretary French uh, and his team will be working with stakeholders to get through the other hurdles. We know that they're there. They're not there for every single school, uh, but, uh, but we are cognizant of the fact that we have other work to do. And, and, and again, if, if we're all on the same page, we all want the same thing for our kids, then we can work through anything that's achievable. We can work through these um, if we have the right uh, if we have the right approach. Thank you. Pat, WCAS. Hi, I have a quick clarifying question. Does the news you just got about the from the federal government about likely no new Johnson and Johnson shots for the next couple of weeks change anything in your teacher vaccination plan? It may have a bit of a wrinkle. I would admit we haven't talked about this. Obviously, I just found out about this. Uh, about 20 minutes ago, so Secretary Smith and, and Commissioner Levine had no knowledge of this fact, um, which is unfortunate that we're not going to have some sort of consistent supply for the first uh, couple of weeks anyhow. But again, um, we believe we have more than they think we have uh, in, in hand right now. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, once they're in the safe, so to speak, uh, we should be able to utilize them at our disposal. Um, which is about half or, or double what they what they said they were going to distribute in the first week. So we'll work those details out, find out uh, uh, what uh, we have available. But uh, Secretary Smith, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, in football terms, we'll we'll call an audible here. Um, and what we'll do is um, we'll use what we have in storage. That will get us through the first couple of weeks um, that we have in storage. We'll probably use anything that we can recapture from the long-term care uh, federal program and use some of that as well. But the governor did say some good news is that the federal pharmacy program isn't being reduced. It's being actually increased. And we're relying partly on the federal pharmacy program as well. So. I, I think there may be some minor wrinkles, and we'll have to call some audibles, but as you remember, what I said was we were going to start this program deliberately, slowly, and then ramp up, and it seems like the schedule that the feds are putting forward is coinciding with what we, uh, what we anticipated in terms of our rollout here. Okay, great. I did have a couple other Johnson & Johnson related questions I've gotten from viewers. Will people get to choose which vaccine they receive? Um, I have fielded several inquiries from people who, for whatever reason, don't want Johnson & Johnson shots. You mentioned that teachers would have the option of choosing. Will everyone else? Again, we are going to consider all those factors in the future once we understand the supply. Uh, we're going to get through uh, this uh, system, the education system, 
next, and then uh, we're going to contemplate all of that. We would like people to have a choice, at least uh, to uh, not get there uh, to a vaccination site or to an appointment and not know what they're going to get. Uh, and I think that that's important for us to do. So I'm about choice. Uh, so we will uh, work our way towards uh, giving them the opportunity to, uh, to know what they're going to get when they get there. Um, but to, at this point in time, uh, those uh, Johnson Johnson vaccines are not going to be in the, uh, the, uh, those with underlying conditions, for instance. Um, so we are reserving those uh, Johnson Johnson for the education system at this point. And my last question might help ease some of the concerns about the Johnson & Johnson shot for folks. Did it protect against those um, the people who got sick during the study from having those long hauler symptoms? Commissioner Levine. And that might be better for Dr. Levine. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question to ask, and we don't have any data on that at this point in time. Um, you know, most people use the definition of long hauler three or four months. Uh, after your illness, uh, and this, these EUAs, these emergency use authorizations, generally come after two months of follow-up, so we're going to need to wait a lot longer to see the impact on that. It would be nice because the reality is if you're having less symptomatic illness from any vaccine, uh, we would hope you would have a very, very minimal risk of having a long hauler syndrome which is now called PASC, uh, post-acute uh, symptoms from coronavirus, uh, for what that's worth. But can't answer your question yet. We need to see follow-up data from the studies. Okay, thank you. Wilson, the AP. Um, hi, everybody. All this talk about the J&J &J vaccine, it's almost as though you're worried people aren't going to want it because its efficacy is, what, 72% as opposed to 95%. Have you run into that yet? And is there any concern that uh, people will not want it and it could uh, go wanting? People won't take it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know as we have any fear of people not wanting it. It's just that we don't know. Uh, we haven't, uh, we just got it into, uh, uh, into Vermont. Uh, we're going to uh, start to, to offering it next week. I think we'll know more after the first week of what the acceptance rate is. Uh, I can only talk for myself. If I, if I had a choice, I think I would take the Johnson & Johnson um, because this one shot uh, gives me a greater flexibility you know, two weeks, three weeks, whatever later uh, I'm able to mobilize. So that. That would be my preference, but everyone has different reasons, and we'll learn a little bit more uh, next week. Commissioner Levine. Yeah, and the only thing to add to that, if this were the first vaccine that came out and we didn't yet have the other two, everyone would have said, wow, this is incredible stuff, uh, because you don't see that kind of data in most vaccine trials. So the 72% rate, than the 95% and 100%. You don't see that. Um, and that's really remarkable. So I'm like the governor, you know, if it was available to me, I would take it right now, not a problem. The other reality is, and this is a nuance, uh, when they defined moderate disease in the study trial for the Johnson & Johnson, that's much more equivalent to what in the other two vaccine trials were regarded as more mild symptoms. Uh, so again, definitions matter, outcome measures matter, and that's why it's so challenging to do an apples to apples comparison here because it really isn't possible. But uh, I think you've heard probably abundant uh, people in public health and on the national scene who have really tried to make special efforts because we all know people are going to look at numbers and we have to just make sure they look at the numbers in as informed a way as possible. Um, okay, great. A real other quick question. Um, at the rate we're going, uh, how, I, I know this question has been answered in the past, but I don't know if it's been answered recently. When would you expect, given the pace of vaccinations and the growing pace of vaccinations, you will have everybody who wants to be vaccinated vaccinated? Um, 
I believe uh, that date will be sometime in July, uh, midsummer, um, by the time at the rate we're going, and we see the increases. But a lot of it does depend on Johnson and Johnson and, and so forth. I will go back. Let me go back to the Johnson Johnson for a minute. Um, it could be the other way around, uh, Wilson. It, it there could be uh, those uh, that uh, want the Johnson Johnson. Uh, exceed the supply that we have. There may be more demand than supply. So uh, um, I'm fearful of that uh, as equal. I'm equally uh, fearful of that as I am about uh, those, the acceptance. I think, I think there's quite a few people who I've spoken with uh, who are in the same camp uh, that I am, that I, they, would take it, they would take it tomorrow if it was available to them. Uh, but, but in terms of, you know, it's, I'm, I'm speculating in terms of the uh, amount of supply we're going to be receiving, but I would say, you know, mid-July, early August. Okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much, as always. Lola, VT Digger. Hear me? We can, just barely. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry yeah. about that. Um, so my uh, first quick question is, um, I, I recall a figure of 30,000, that's kind of uh, school staff and child care workers. Is that still kind of roughly the figure we're thinking about when we talk about those eligible employees? I'm going to ask Secretary Smith. I believe it's more than that. Secretary Smith? Lola, we're estimating uh, just north of 35,000. Okay. And so with the 75,000 um, in the high risk categories, we're thinking a little over 100,000 people in total are in this next phase of vaccination. Yes. Um, and by the time we get done in March, we'll have about one third of Vermont done. Okay. Um, and I wanted to double back to, you know, the goal of full in-person instruction, which obviously vaccinating school staff is, is a part of. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions from school employees about where um, students who have opted into all remote, all remote instruction fit into this. Um, is there an expectation that school districts will continue offering that, or is there an expectation that those children should be asked to come back to school? Um, a lot of those uh, families have opted into this because, you know, they have someone in their family who is high risk, et cetera. So I'm just wondering what the thinking is on that population, which is pretty significant. I think it's about 15 percent of, of students. Yeah, that's one of the questions we uh, we need to answer in the next um, week or so. Uh, and it's on on the table and we uh, will probably will uh, in all likelihood uh, be reaching out to see what the you know teachers, uh, principals, uh, superintendents, and and those families th think about this uh, with the uh, with the vaccines coming becoming available for staff, whether that changes their perspective. So uh, we'll uh, we'll be able to give more information in the week ahead. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Um, I may just go back, um, Secretary French. Is there anything you want to add to that? No, I think, um, you know, your point, Governor, we, we, we have to iterate our way through this, and certainly the priority now in vaccination is going to be a, a major goal, and uh, we'll remove one of the, the obstacles, I think, to making more progress on more in person, but we'll, we'll be uh, trying to understand what's going on and what, um, what the interest level and capacity of the district to move forward in the coming weeks. Thank you. All right, that's all. Thank you. Hi, Governor. I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one on uh, those under 16 and um, uh, explaining why the, they aren't included. I, I think I know the answer to this question. But in a lot of these uh, um, health conditions, uh, people can be more vulnerable when they're younger than, than older. And I know there's a lot of concern out there from parents, of course, 
uh, about kids with uh, chronic conditions or chromosomal. Um, yeah, they they just haven't haven't gone through the trials yet. Um, the FDA uh, and the manufacturers haven't finished their trials. I'm sure that they're continuing with those. I, I I believe that that will be the next step, and we may see that sometime in the fall uh, in terms of uh, vaccinating a younger po population. But they just haven't completed their trials at this point. Uh, that, that's what I figured, and I was just wondering what you what you would tell to those uh, say to those parents. Uh, uh, Probably you know, the the same same there. thing that I just told you. <laughs> we just don't know uh, at this point, and uh, and just make sure that everyone is uh, continues to wear a mask, uh, tries to keep their distance. All the things we've been telling people to do over the last year uh, will still be important as we move our way through this. The the mask is going to uh, mask wearing will be uh, continuing especially in the schools uh, through, as we th continue through the vaccination process. Uh, that's what I, I anticipated the answer to be. Uh, as far as the, the federal funding is concerned, it's philosophically, uh, Governor Sununu, um, your colleague in New Hampshire, basically said, oh, we don't want that money or, people, or the federal government shouldn't give the states and the municipalities that money if they haven't had their, their budgets in order anyway. And I was wondering what your, your thought was on that as long as there's flexibility uh, within the appropriation um, we certainly could use it I, I would advocate as I did in our budget this uh, this go around that I presented to the legislature uh, that we uh, if there is flexibility uh, we use it for uh, one-time expenses uh, to uh, to give us the the best return uh, investing in areas that we know uh, that we need to continue to work on whether it be broadband or whether it be uh, uh, weatherization or whether it be anything uh, to to give us the highest return uh, and to provide for a better future uh, for us and a much more affordable future and so uh, again I'm we will we're not going to turn it away uh, if it's offered and uh, we just hope that there's enough flexibility in there uh, for us to use it to our advantage all right great thank you um, hello. If uh, all goes as well as you hope and um, the rollout of the vaccine is complete by sometime in July, do you have any sense of what that would mean in terms of, you know, a change in life um, as compared to the present time? Uh, especially given the fact that until um, trials for younger people are concerned, there will be some kind of reservoir of COVID uh, among, you know, uh, teenagers at least um, around the state. So, I mean, will we still be wearing masks and um, staying six feet apart, or will something else be the normal I, I would say that we'll be continue to be very very cautious and careful uh, we'll continue to monitor this it really does depend on how many people receive the vaccine uh, and again we're not on an island we uh, do uh, enjoy a, a hospitality sector that welcomes people from other states and other regions into Vermont so uh, it's not all about Vermonters so we're still going to have to be uh, very very careful and as you mentioned uh, this won't include, at least in the, the near future, uh, those under the age of uh, 18 or 16 uh, until the trials are complete and there's, or there's a vaccination uh, that uh, is uh, uh, suitable uh, for that population. So, so again, I, I just, and maybe Dr. Levine, I'm not trying to put a damper on anything, um, but uh, when we get through the vaccination process, the, the vaccine or the the, the virus doesn't disappear. You know, it's still going to be with us. It's still going to be here, just like the flu is uh, now. It just won't be uh, as uh, uh, as acute as it is today, or you know, as life threatening as it has been over the last year. But um, but it's not going away uh, because it uh, it can't be eliminated, just like any other virus. Uh, I might ask Commissioner Levine to weigh in too. can't disagree with anything that I've just heard. Um, 
lots of us in public health are talking about the fall towards the winter for uh, when perhaps masking won't be as mandatory an activity. I would dare say, though, that you're talking about July. Um, we may find that that's a time when outdoor masking is not necessary because we know the ability to transmit the virus outdoors is so low compared to crowded indoor settings. Um, not promising that, just saying that, you know, in terms of some tangible change that you might actually see. The um, lots of forces working together here. We have the natural immunity rate that people are getting from getting COVID, those who are unfortunate enough to have that. We have the vaccine mediated immunity that we hope high percentages of Vermonters will have. We have these variant strains that really aren't making a big fuss right now, except we think about them all the time and talk about them all the time. Uh, and we need to see exactly where that goes in this country specifically and how it might be impacted by travel, et cetera. Um, and we need to basically just see how all of the data that we look at every week here looks. But there's no reason to think that we'll be in the same place over the summer that we are in today or even the same place in the fall that we are in today. So I would certainly invite uh, the optimistic look you would like to have. Uh, we just can't tell you the pace of how that will move and exactly what will happen. Because as the governor said, the virus doesn't just disappear. Some people are talking about seasonality to the virus. And is that why we saw this dramatic drop off in cases uh, here and around the world? But we all also know that Seasonality wasn't really an issue before. We had three surges all in different seasons. Uh, so I'm not sure that part makes as much sense. I do think that human behaviors are everything. Uh, and I think that's probably accounting for the most dramatic part of what we saw in the data. So we'll just have to see, Joe. Um, I have a, another question or from a reader, which is probably for Dr. Levine, if he thinks it's proper to answer it even. Um, this uh, reader asked whether one of the three vaccines is better than the other for a person who, like himself, uh, has multiple sclerosis. Ah. I've never been given the option about answering a question before, but I'll, I'll answer that one. Uh, the, um, the problem with the vaccine trials is they're a vaccine versus a placebo for each vaccine. We don't have any head-to-head -head trials that look at one vaccine versus another to know how it might do in different populations, et cetera. Um, multiple sclerosis is clearly a uh, chronic condition it does elevate one's risk of having a more severe part of COVID, both due to the disease and sometimes due to the uh, immunosuppressing drugs that can be used to treat the disease. Um, none of the three trials, uh, to my awareness, would have enough people with that disease or with the drugs used to treat that disease to help this uh, person make a, a real evidence-based decision. So I would just go with the fact that all of the uh, trials showed that if you had comorbidities, which means other conditions that made you at higher risk, uh, you seem to do uh, uh, well with the vaccine, not any worse than somebody who was completely healthy and got the vaccine. So uh, I would just take the one that they can take and uh, be protected. Thank you very much for agreeing to answer the question. Uh, thanks for your time. I'd, yes, hello. Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to uh, do one more follow-up just to like, make sure I have clarification on the coach's question. There's a lot of folks who coach and spend many hours a week uh, with various school teams during this season in their indoors, but they aren't employed as staff or faculty at those schools. 
I just wanted to clarify whether or not they would be eligible for a vaccination under the teacher program. I, I believe yes uh, is the answer. Uh, that uh, is just whether they're paid for um, by the community, but but they're in the school. They're in. Uh, they're interacting with kids. So that's part of the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other question that just I noticed from some conversations that I've had with other pharmacies who are in the federal program that would like to be providing, uh, obviously, vaccinations to Vermont, uh, including Shaw's and Hannaford's and Price Chopper. Uh, could you give us, or, or Secretary Smith, give us a little bit more information? Uh, for instance, I heard a couple of them saying that they were waiting for a timeline or approval from the state of Vermont, but I still understood it really to be uh, the federal government's decision when they would participate in our state. Yeah, i would let Secretary Smith answer that, but, but keep in mind those who are in the system at this point in time have uh, contracted with the federal government and we we're going to be looking for opportunities uh, as we increase the supply we're going to need all of those pharmacies uh, to help us with the vaccination process secretary smith thanks for the thanks for the question uh, as you noticed i mentioned wall um walmart will be uh, adding six stores to the um to our sort of distribution of vaccine as we move forward. Um, they will be part of the federal uh, pharmacy program and will allocate uh, based on the federal pharmacy program. We're also looking at Hannaford's and others, Costco, for example, as, as we move forward. One of the things that we wanna make sure is that they're integrating with our system and uh, Walmart has been a, a fantastic partner. Kinney Drugs has been a fantastic partner in terms of integrating their systems into ours. Walmart in particular, you don't go to Walmart, you go to our system in order to um, get your appointment. And secondly, um, you get your appointment over multiple weeks in, in these systems. We're looking at how we integrate these systems and bringing them on uh, one at a time. I know that Hannaford, uh, we're fairly close in discussions with. I think we have had discussions with Costco uh, as we move forward. So I think what you'll see in the next few weeks is more and more of these um, uh, these pharmacies coming, uh, these pharmacies or pharmacies within like a Hannaford or, or even perhaps a Shaw's. I haven't heard if we've been in discussions with Shaw's coming online as we move forward. Thanks. One quick follow-up on that. One, one uh, former participant was Rite Aid, and I wondered if they, uh, if that gets them in a position where they're uh, able to come back more quickly as a participant, or if they were one that didn't integrate as well with the Vermont system. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Rite Aid is CVS. Is that correct? I, I think so. But um, uh, I think CVS owns uh, Rite Aid. If I'm incorrect, I, I apologize, but I think I'm making a leap of judgment here that that's CVS. CVS was in our long-term uh, care program. Uh, as you know, we started out uh, vaccinating long-term care with the federal pharmacy program. We had Kenny's, we had uh, CVS, and we had Walgreens. Um, we're still in discussion. I mean, we have recaptured some of the um, some of the um, leftover doses from the long-term care. Um, long-term care program from CVS as we have with Walgreens, um, but um, we are still in discussions with CVS. Great, thanks very much. Can I just add to the- yeah, Good afternoon. Can I just add to the confusion? Um, Commissioner Pichek has said it was Rite Aid and CVS uh, that CVS bought some of Rite Aid um, some of their stores, but not all of them. So there are just a few, maybe five or six in Vermont that are still Rite Aid. So just to add to the confusion. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yep, yep, great, thank you. Uh, uh, probably for uh, Secretary Smith, um, wondering about the, the school-based Johnson & Johnson clinics. Um, 
Uh, when will you be able to announce a schedule um, of those clinics and how are you organizing those? Um, and by that, I mean uh, sort of on the micro and macro level. Uh, first, what schools will be going first? And then would it be your plan to vaccinate an entire staff in one clinic or would you be looking to do just a portion or percentage at a time? Yeah, it, it, with the Johnson Johnson, it would be our, our uh, intent to uh, vaccinate all staff at the uh, at the clinic. So let me sort of outline how this is going to work for the bigger sort of districts, and for those that have big districts within sort of a geographical area. We'll probably use what it, what we would call a vaccination clinic, and probably run by the National Guard. That we would bring multiple schools into that vaccination clinic. For others that are more rural, perhaps, and uh, other areas, we would do a district approach. And in that approach, we would probably use the health department. Uh, we will use the health department uh, personnel uh, that had originally set up the points of distribution in the original sort of, I know it's only weeks ago, it sounds like years ago now, but um, in the original sort of vaccination program, and, and we've spread that program out to more and more healthcare providers. And so we would use um, the healthcare uh, personnel, the health department personnel to set up those district wide and include um, school nurses as well. For individual um, schools, which are small schools, perhaps in the most rural of areas, we will send um, EMS along with the school nurse and other personnel into the actual school uh, to do the vaccination. That's how we plan on doing um, uh, this in the next month. And um, uh, will the schedule be available, say, before the eligibility opens up for teachers? I guess I'm just wondering from a practical standpoint, a teacher who may have an opportunity to book at Walgreens um, through the special sign-up I think you alluded to earlier, or to wait for a clinic that might be coming to their school or district. How, how are they to sort of weigh their options? Yeah, the, the, here's how it's going to work. Um, we'll start releasing um, where we're going to go here in the next, uh, they will be contacted, the school will be contacted, we'll set up a time for the clinic. At the same time, we'll set up an alternative for Walgreens during that time. They're not gonna be sort of set up separately. It's gonna be all together as they're being set up so that it's all coordinated and we can get the list to Walgreens of that particular school or that school district or that area in which we're vaccinating. I would say in the next week, uh, we will have that list available. Um, we will see how the sign up goes in various uh, places, which I'll talk about on Friday. I'll give you um, how registration is going to be happening on Friday. I will also uh, then set up the schedule. Once we have registration, set up the schedule beyond that. Okay, and then uh, one final question, probably for um, uh, Commissioner Levine. Um, uh, does Johnson & Johnson vaccination get treated any differently in terms of the um, relaxed uh, travel and social gathering um, guidance. Uh, do you wait two weeks after the Johnson vaccination or four weeks before you're given the green light to leave the state or to, uh, to mingle with another household? So there should be no uh, difference with regard to the guidance, whichever vaccine you received. Since it is a one dose, uh, it would be two weeks after that dose. Though, as I said in my earlier comments, you'll be far more protected uh, by the four-week mark. Okay, thank you, everyone. Avery, Hello, we've been getting several questions from Vermonters who've gotten vaccines at three different Walgreens locations. Um, they were given the Pfizer shot and then were told for their second shot it will be scheduled four weeks out instead of three. And when the patients brought that up as a point of concern, they were told that was how it's being done. Is that advisable from the health department's perspective? Is that something you all have heard about being done? I know there's one that's three weeks and one that's four weeks, but uh, Dr. Levine? 
<clears throat> in the best of all worlds, it'd be best if you do the three-week one of three weeks and the four-week one of four weeks, but the messaging really all along has been that's a rough idea. You know, it might fall on a day of the week somebody can't be there. It might fall uh, in a, in a, on a weekend when they're not around or what have you. So the reality is um, you want people to come close. We've uh, decided within the health department that there's really a window of about two weeks on either side that would actually be effective. The CDC recently came out and said uh, if you go as long as six weeks um, with the, uh, sec for the second dose, uh, that's okay. They wouldn't recommend any longer than six weeks. So again, um, I don't want to sound imprecise and say that, you know, th that um, if you missed by the day, you would do better or do worse. But the reality is the trials were set up with those parameters, so those are the ones we should follow. But the precision with which you get at that exact day, uh, there is a window of opportunity. And if uh, somebody was going to go one week longer on the vaccine that uh, required a three-week interval and they went four weeks, I really don't think that would have any significant impact based on um, what we know this far. So should Walgreens be following the CDC recommendations as a rule or as you just mentioned, kind of just the general guideline? Well, I think I, it's not the CDC recommendations. It's actually the manufacturer recommendations and the stipulation with which the vaccines were released for emergency use authorization. But I did say that if for some reason a person waited as long as six weeks, that's within the parameters that the CDC says would be okay. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily want everyone to err on that side of the equation. They should be closer to the three- and four-week mark. Okay, thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle Vermont State Health. Uh, Governor, uh, I have heard, um, well, I guess my first question is, why, why were Newport, Newport inmates vaccinated before the corrections officers and now that the that inmates are being vaccinated, will DOC consider allowing vital outside services like prison ministries and Alcoholics Anonymous to visit in person? Yeah, I think the confusion lies in we've used the age banding approach uh, in Vermont, and that included uh, the offender population. So if they were 75 and over, 70 and over, now 65 and over, uh, they were included in that, as were the staff, but however, staff isn't typically over 65. So they're all included. So it's going to take a while before the entire population is vaccinated. But, um, you know, again, just like the rest of us, um, they're, everyone's just going to have to wait their turn. So it was, this was not based on uh, inmate or guard status. It was completely on age, you're saying. That's right, but I will say okay. the, the public safety, um, the, what we're doing uh, in expansion of 1A, phase 1A uh, in public safety will include uh, the uh, correctional officers. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, how, about the, uh, how about the allowing outside services to come in uh, now that now the inmates are being vaccinated. But, but they aren't, when, when you know, it's, it's the vast population. If you look at the population, it's mm -hmm. only the, you know, 65 and over. So we're still going to have to, we'll consider mm -hmm. that as we move forward. But again, it's about having everyone vaccinated um, before we uh, introduce mm -hmm. anyone from the outside coming in. The reason we're doing uh, the correctional officers is that is the only port of entry uh, for the virus right now is staff. Uh, so that's the only way it can come in uh, to the facility. So if we can, you know, establish a perimeter, so to speak, and uh, defend that perimeter, uh, then we should be able to keep everyone safe. Okay. My second question is, uh, I've just been told by a church leader that his church distributed food boxes in February, but has been excluded for March because one of our congressional leaders doesn't want churches distributing these food boxes. 
Uh, is this anything that you have heard about, you or perhaps Mike Smith have heard about? And uh, if so, what, what's your reaction? I, I have not heard about this, but uh, Secretary Smith may have. I believe you're talking about Guy, and I don't know, but I, I believe you're talking about the, the Farm to Families program. And what we had found is that the distribution, the contractor, the federal contractor, had basically not provided enough uh, money into the contract to have an adequate distribution system within the state. They got the, they got the um, food to the state. They did re rely on um, those sort of uh, religious organizations to help uh, distribute that. But I, from what I heard, uh, those organizations were overwhelmed. And what we did is we did step in uh, as a state, provided money in order to go back to the system that was originally done um, and was successful, and that's going through the local food banks for distribution. And uh, from what I understand, that system is starting to work much, much better than the system that was in place. Well, what I'm hearing on the ground is that the, the church thing was, was going great, it was all volunteer. Uh, and they're sort of wondering, hey, we were doing a great job. What's, what's up with that? Is there any chance that they can be worked back into the system? Well, what I was hearing on the ground is just the, the opposite, that the uh, system was overwhelmed. It wasn't being distributed the way that it should be, and it wasn't being distributed as fast as it should be. How we can integrate those volunteers, I'm, willing, I'm all ears. Um, if we've got volunteers that are eager to help with distribution, I'm certainly all ears on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll uh, we'll be back with you on Friday. Thanks.